Welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining the first of our trade talks by TradeCloud. Uh, I'm just going to make a brief introduction as we go as more and more people enter the room. And then when we are ready to go, we'll introduce the panelists and we'll get started with the full process of the day. Okay, so why are we doing this everyone? Um, we believe that our industry is at a pivotal point when it comes to the conversations around uh, the key conversations in the industry, particularly in this case around trade finance, which is why we set up on how digitization in trade finance creates trust. Uh, we think that there's a forum where these topics we discuss more openly uh, amongst the community of relevant stakeholders. And for that reason, we wanted to bring the trade now community into this conversation and start to discuss and start to introduce uh, the, uh, the conversations amongst experts in the industry and all of the relevant people that we want to communicate. Okay, so we've got a fantastic lineup of panelists today, um, experienced panelists, independent panelists, those that represent industry, financing, banks, uh, traders. So a very good overview. Um, and importantly, not only experienced, but each of them known for having something important to say in the uh, world of trade finance. So as we move ahead in the presentation, I'd like to introduce our panelists that you'll see on the left-hand side here. Introducing John McNamara. Most of you know him as Mac. Mac started the Deutsche Bank Trade Finance uh, uh, Department and ran it for many Commod years. Commod 35 years okay. Sorry, Commodity Trade Finance. Commodity um, Trade Finance. Did. Thanks. Trade Mark. Finance at Deutsche was thousands of people, but uh, we, we were the specialists. <laughs> thanks, John. That makes thanks for that clarification. And John now runs Carl Sharton Commodities, which is advising and educating, importantly, uh, many of the uh, people in the industry who, who are looking to upgrade their trade finance skills. We also have Marilyn, Marilyn Summers, who's got 21 years in commodity finance, as you'll see on the screen at very important uh, institutions, BNP and the Tixis, and she's currently looking after the Energy and Natural Resources Department out of New York. We're joined by Ricard Bordier, 20 years experience across trading and finance uh, at, at important leading trading houses and banks, and is currently spearheading uh, TFA, trade finance advisory um, companies, advising and consulting and helping uh, companies out there in the trade finance, commodity trade finance world, manage risks and upgrade to best practices. As is Damien de Rosny, who joins us Previously at Societe Generale for 20 years and also helping uh, Michael Boyer at TFA Advisors. And your moderator today is Andrew Glass. Andrew has 23 years of experience across a very interesting mix, the leading traders, banks, and also the industrial party. So he's a very interesting person to steer this conversation uh, and be very excited to see how it goes. I'm Daf Davis. I'm the Global Head of Marketing for TradeCloud. I'm going to take a back seat from now on on this conversation and hand over to you, Andrew. Well, thanks very much, Daf. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, TradeCloud, for hosting this event. And thank you, for everyone, for joining us, John, Marilyn, Michael, and Damien. Um, as we move through this as well, please ask any questions you like. Um, you can either use the, um, preferably use the Zoom, the chat function. Um, and then we'll, we'll endeavour to weave your questions in to the conversation today over the next hour. Um, otherwise, we'll leave them to the end and we'll, we'll ask our panellists. Um, <coughs> so with that said, I'd like to launch straight into it because we want to cover as much ground as possible. So we're particularly thinking the overall sort of target of today is the discussion about how digitalisation creates trust in trade finance. And it, I'm sure we'll all be acutely aware there's been a very interesting time in 2020 um, particularly with the fraud issues that we've had here. Um, we've had this uh, Global Commodities Summit going on at the moment, the FT hosts as well, and there has been 
a lot of the last two days, and I'd gather today as well, we'll be talking about the fraud and how we into this, and particularly liquidity and banks take pulling back from liquidity in, in, in trade finance. So highly topical time to be discussing this, and hopefully an inflection point on digitisation. We've been talking about it for a long time, so hopefully this will bring it to the fore. So moving on to the first question, um, and I'd like to direct this to John uh, in the first thing, which parts of the physical commodity supply chain that impact upon the security of trade finance um, uh, are ripe to benefit from digitisation? Over to you, John. <laughs> um, well, uh, good morning, everybody. Nice to be here. Nice to see you all. Uh, well, to see some of you, at least through the limits of technology. Um, I, I've been a, a commodity uh, trade finance specialist all my career. I, I started in 1982 uh, working for traders and uh, switched to banks in 1990. Um, and so one of the things you see is um, <clears throat> the longer term cycles and these things sort of come and go. And I've got to say right now, it feels very 1999. Uh, you know, back then we'd had the... Um, uh, emerging markets crisis or people talked about the submerging markets and nobody wanted to do um, commodity trade finance commodities were a bit of a dirty word uh, and then we had the commodity super cycle and now here, here we are back at square one uh, with people pulling out of commodity trade finance right left and center i think the, the the challenge we've had with fraud and fraud is always a risk is that somehow fraud is always um taken uh, worse by people when it comes to commodity trade finance. If you have a, a dodgy dealer on a bond desk somewhere and he commits fraud, they say, ah, oh, rogue trader. They get rid of him. They bring in another one, probably even more expensive. And they say, that last guy, he was terrible, but this new guy, he's going to be great. And, and everybody carries on again. But with commodities, it, 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 it's really quite a, um, a hole below the waterline when you have a big fraud. And we've had I think my latest count is about 18 big frauds, um, particularly in Singapore, also in Dubai, the odd one in Europe. And this has frightened the horses. What part of the physical supply chain is it? Um, I think the, the area where we've particularly got into trouble has been title fraud. And if you look at the documents we have in trade finance, like bills of lading, these things have been around um, since before my grandfather was born. And since my grandfather fought in the First World War, that gives you some idea of, of how long we're talking. Uh, the particular issue with a lot of the documentary frauds, the title frauds, whether it's a warehouse receipt or a warehouse warrant or a, uh, a bill of lading, is it's usually possible through Google even, never mind the International Maritime Bureau or some other specialist agency uh, or a collateral manager to tell um, that the ship actually exists, the warehouse actually exists, there is commodity in the warehouse, um, and maybe there's a certain quantity of commodity. The hard part is to know to whom it belongs and to whom it's pledged. And if you can crack that, if you can press a button and tell this parcel is, is owned by A and pledged to B, then I think you've built the proverbial better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. But at the moment, um, it does seem much easier to tell the stuff exists than it does to tell who owns it and controls it. So if I were um, a digital boy, which I have to say I'm not, you know, I'd, I'd drive a car with an eight track, which you know, most people are saying we shouldn't be driving cars anymore, never mind have eight tracks in them. Um, then, uh, then that was what that's what I'd be focusing on, and I, I think some people are focusing on this now. Um, I'm not clear that there's an outright winner in terms of. Um, cracking that one. Um, awesome, thanks, Mac. Um, a question I'd like to sort of go also building on what you were talking about there with the fraud and, and the way the, the market structure and banking in particular. Um, it's a bit of a curly one, but at the end of the day, is they're not um, the same stuff we've seen over and over and over again. Keeps hearing it. Andrew, you're breaking up. Andrew, I can't hear you.
to ask something a little technical issue. Yeah, okay, we seem to have lost Andrew. We'll give him a chance to come back. And I think it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, you know, what you were saying, Matt, and I'm anticipating where Andrew was going with that in lieu of him coming back. I, I think, you know, it seems that we, we do have this repetition of the same thing going on one way or another and manifesting itself. And at the same time, we have this uh, emergence of the technology. And there's a question of like, well, technology can do certain things and digitization can do certain things. Um, but we have to be careful about where to apply it and, and to what situation. Do you have any thoughts about, you know, what parts of uh, uh, that are risky in the supply chain that you think are beneficial to be applied with technology uh, and any particular areas that you think that need to be focused on from other points of view? Well, yeah, so uh, blockchain has been with us for quite a long time and we've all been talking about distributed ledgers as a solution to all sorts of things. The letter of credit, I think, dates from the 14th century when the... Um, uh, we thank the Italians for that. <clears throat> and in terms of structured trade finance, um, which is my particular um, area of focus, things like the Red Clause Letter of Credit, we can thank the Australians for in the 1840s. Um, so there's a lot of history going back in these dot credits uh, where you would have thought in this day and age it shouldn't be necessary to send physical bits of paper around the planet to represent cargo titles. Um, we have had the electronic bill of lading, we have had the electronic. Uh, payment undertaking for quite a while, they never seem to get much traction for various reasons. And, and when you go to court, and I'm an um, expert witness in arbitration case at the moment, one of the key issues is, ah, the bank was dealing with copies. They didn't have the, the physical original bills of lading in their hands. Yeah. And um, that seemed to be a, a terrible weakness. Uh, and, and so when you get to court, they, they really want to see that you had the original documents. So if you can if you can perfect that electronically, I think that that's one area uh, of advance. You've got to bring the, the, the lawyers with you and the legal industry with you. Mm. I think the, <clears throat> the security over payment is something that we've been talking about for a long time uh, with digital, which, um, again, we've seen lots of proof of concept. We haven't really seen industry-wide take up. And then the third area, which I think uh, has actually been a lot more successful, has been on the ESG side, where... Um, if you look at, let's say, palm oil, um, which we all use every day without knowing it, and is in pretty much everything, and is in all our, in Europe, it's in all our petrol, of course. Mm. Um, when it says E10, mm -hmm. that uh, that 10% is uh, is typically palm oil uh, originated. Um, there you've got, the, on the one hand, the farmer who's slashing down the rainforest and killing the orangutans. On the other hand, you've got the responsible farmer who's doing it all carefully and rehoming the orangutans. And obviously you want to um, work with the latter and avoid the former. And um, there, the blockchain, the distributed ledger is helping you because it's giving you audit trail from that, that cup of coffee or that, that petrol pump um, on the street in Europe, um, all the way back through the supply chain to... Uh, the good field in Malaysia as opposed to the um, uh, the less good field uh, next door. And, and it's that audit trail which uh, particularly has become effective. And I think the Dutch banks have been leading the market on this. Uh, I saw a very good presentation on this from the colleagues at Rabo, uh, which, which um, uh, I like the look of. Um, but we, we still haven't got global traction, have we? Uh, there's a lot of things being done in a very old-fashioned way all around the planet. Mm. Speaking of old fashioned, I'm very sorry about the Wi Fi here. Yeah. Oh, sorry to yeah. drop out there. I was, trying to get I was trying to get controversial too. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how much you got of that, but basically saying that this has happened over and over again. It's very old. Um, the board was unsophisticated. So, has this not got something to do with regulators and banks in particular, um, but uh -huh. other finances actually changing the KPIs of those involved, uh, the bonus structures? Because aren't aren't bankers being incentivized in trade finance to accept this and hopefully they don't have a catastrophic market move that means that they get if they get in trouble holding the bag for the, the fraud or defaults um so is there not something to be done here because it seems like the banking industry also and trade financing more generally needs to get on the front foot work together as a as a uh, industry to push digitalization to finally put the nail in the coffin of these unsophisticated frauds. So with that, um, Marilyn, would you have a, would you like to have a, have a crack at that one? Sorry to put you on that one. Mm. 
Yeah. We've lost Marilyn now. Sorry, you're on mute, Marilyn. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. Oh. Uh, maybe it was on purpose. <laughs> Sorry to throw you a curly one like that. No, very. I, I do agree that for this to work, all the banks have to work together to have something because obviously bank security is a big issue and cybersecurity is an issue. So all the banks have to work to be on a digital platform collectively and together. Um, do you think regulators have a role to play here as well, enforcing that? I mean, the Singaporean government, for example, MAS is extremely embarrassed, as is the Singaporean um, ecosystem, about the frauds that took place here with Hing Leong right on its front doorstep. Um, is, it, is it regulators that need to step in here as well? I think in the US, we're extremely bound by regulators. Um, I don't know what the impact of local regulators is globally, but in the US, the regulators monitor every move the banks make here. So we think it's a very safe environment for specifically for the US. Okay, good stuff. Can, can I chip in on this? Because I've, I've recently plowed through all the rules in um, Singapore and the, uh, the rules around trade finance in Singapore are actually very comprehensive and pretty good. There's a whole um, set of uh, red flags they put up for these should be warnings for this and these should be warnings for that. Um, there's nothing particularly wrong with the rules. The trouble is people aren't following them. Um, uh, that's in Singapore. I, I think the, the wider challenge you've got with regulation is a lot of the regulation barks up the wrong tree so far as trade finance is concerned. So there's been all this stuff about how do we make banks safer. One of the things they did with Bell 3 was they brought in the, the leverage ratio, which is meant to make banks safer by making banks less less levered. But the consequence of that, if you're in a lending team and trade finance is a lending team, and just to mention there is, is the lending teams typically don't have the same bonus structures as the masters of the universe on the dealing desks or in the M&A teams. So it's not the question, not the case that you're looking at this quarter's profit and saying, oh, goody, that's my bonus. No, it's not like that at all. Um, the, the, the challenge with the, the leverage ratio is that gives you, in lending terms, a return on assets target because you're comparing how good for the balance sheet of the bank is, is this deal compared to that deal. Um, and you compare it by return on assets. Now, return on assets is how we used to measure banks in the 1980s. And, and we all turned around in the 80s and said, well, this is stupid, actually, isn't it? Because it's, um, it's a bit like somebody in the army saying, last one to get killed is a sissy. Um, how do we get, how do we get the, uh, uh, the balance sheet bigger and bigger? And um, the, when Bar 1 came in, we all congratulated ourselves as to how intelligent we've suddenly become because we finally look at return on shareholder value. Uh, instead of that stupid measure of return on assets. And then 25 years later, we've gone in a big circle and come back to return on assets. And the trouble with return on assets as a target is trade finance doesn't score so well on that. So it's not bad, but it's not fantastic. The the, the, the gambler, sorry, trader, we should say in the bank, um, is going to outperform the trade finance, the trade finance team every day of the week, right up to the moment when he loses his shirts by taking the wrong position. Um, the, the, the second thing which regulations part of the wrong tree is um, risk analysis. And uh, the thing that they've decided, and, and of course the Americans split the field on this, but the Europeans have fallen into step, is forward-looking modeling. They want a five-year or at least a three-year forward-looking model of the balance sheet of the P&L for the trader. Well, that's a great one, isn't it? How do you model next year for Blencourt? Yeah, one of the top line of any model projection is, is how much are they going to sell? Well, to know that, I've got to know the commodity price. And by definition, we don't know the commodity price. So the first line is already wrong. And then you build your model error upon error upon that. Second line being, what's the cost base? And, and that's probably a foreign exchange uh, rate uh, function. And you don't know that either. Um, so the, there's a lot of focus on that and less focus on the traditional things of what's the management like? What's the UBO like? Uh, does the uh, Is there a charismatic uh, manager who runs the whole thing it's um uh, it's become um uh, a lot of tick boxes nobody actually paying attention to the fundamentals yeah no that, that makes sense and, and and it's not for the first time right like you said it seems to come round and round again um and this is hopefully this 2020 will be a year of numerous inflection points and adoption and change 
Um, so with that, I'd like to move on to question two, if that's okay. Um, and I'm going to target this one to, to Damien to respond um, primarily. So we've all heard about the recent high profile case of fraud. We stick with the same sort of subject here, uh, unfortunately. What exactly happened and what were the real impacts? And I suppose we're going to talk here about transparency, accountability, and most importantly, credibility throughout the system. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. So um, I'm based in Singapore. I've been based in Singapore for 14 years. And uh, obviously, I was in the forefront uh, when those fruits uh, came out uh, a year ago. Um, so I'll uh, have the difficult task to uh, bring a bit of light uh, to the recent uh, fraud cases. Um, most of those cases are obviously still under investigation. So uh, some uh, news uh, and uh, some information uh, might be uh, different in, in a couple of months. Uh, just, uh, I just want to give you a few, uh, few names and uh, amounts because I think it's important to have, uh, for all of us to have in mind uh, what is at stake for all the financial institutions. So if we start with a few names in the oil industry, we have in Leong uh, where the, uh, the potential loss for a financial institution is $3.5 billion. Uh, we have Zenrock uh, again on the oil uh, uh, Front, which is $150 million. If we continue in Asia, we have agri-trade in coal and, and soft commodity for $1 billion. Then if we move to Middle East, uh, we have uh, Phoenix, uh, which is about uh, $1 billion. And, and the last one, uh, uh, Gulf Petroleum, where we don't really know where we're going uh, we're to finish. But this is, I think, very important to have this in mind um, uh, to, to, to know why all the banks and the actors need to uh, react strongly uh, given uh, given those uh, given those amounts, uh, just uh, just one one point on why did it happen? Uh, again, obviously, uh, all the banks and all the people are still asking themselves those those questions. But I think one uh, one of the answer is that uh, after the first fraud, all the banks started to review their portfolios. I think they started to tight, tighten all the uh, the credit, reduce the lines, and at the same time, we were uh, having a lot of volatility in the commodity prices. So obviously some traders had to pay margin calls and at the same time having their banks uh, reducing their lines created a major liquidity issue and uh, all those frauds which uh, sometimes did happen for many years uh, did uh, come into light at, uh, at, that, uh, at that moment. Um, just in terms of fraud, I mean, uh, we would need uh, hours and hours uh, to give a, a detailed uh, uh, analysis of the frauds but mainly the, the, the fraud that we have seen are fake transactions and double uh, transactions. And uh, the frauds have been, uh, have been very complex. complex. And uh, obviously, the more complex the frauds are, the more complex the solution has to be. And obviously, there is not only one solution. There are a, a number of solutions that have, been, have to be uh, being put together. But just to uh, give you uh, one or two examples of, uh, of uh, element of frauds, uh, for instance, uh, I mean, we have been uh, shown uh, fake documents um, presented by uh, some, uh, some uh, traders. There have been some uh, companies which have been created, which, which were part of the fraud. There have been uh, traders which bought some email domains uh, of their own customers, which basically um, sent emails to the bank to confirm all the information of the transactions. So just that's just really very very highlight uh, on on the on the fraud that we uh, that we have seen, but again I, I just wanted to uh, to show a bit the complexity of those frauds and and uh, and the complexity of the reply that we need to uh, to give to, uh, to those frauds. Uh, in terms of the uh, impact uh, on the sector, so obviously it has been a tsunami, uh, obviously in Singapore uh, clearly, um, and uh, it has started to drive the liquidity. Um, a number of banks have been starting reviewing their portfolios, either cutting their uh, limits or um, changing the structure of the financing that they were proposing. I think none of the trade and community banks have been uh, avoiding uh, all those uh, frauds, so they are all impacted. And uh, the traders which have been suffering the most are the small and, uh, and medium traders. Another very important point that uh, I wanted to highlight is that the trust which existed in this business has gone. So the trust between the banks, the trust between the traders, the trust between the, the banks and the traders. I mean, we have seen uh, banks where wrongly or rightly uh, have refused to pay on the LCs where the documents have been accepted. We have seen today a bank suing Glencore, which was part of some trade with uh, Indeon. Again, rightly or wrongly, we will see when, uh, when uh, the, uh, the legal course uh, uh, is, uh, will, will be uh, finalized. 
But all this to show you that there is a, a very large element of trust, which was very important in our in our business, which uh, which, uh, which I've done. Please. Oh, sorry. No, sorry, sorry. Please go on. No, I was just going to say that's a great point, right? I mean, that word trust that underpins the whole industry and always has. I mean, what are we in commodities? We're the second oldest industry in the world, right? Exactly. Um, and trust has always been a fundamental part of that. I mean, I came up through agriculture, right? And the handshake with the farmer is more than any document. Um, and I think that still exists to a large degree in a, in a lot of the, the ecosystem. And we want to be that way. Um, but it's, that's why this fraud is, is, is consistently a problem in, in that trust, which you make a very good point on key word. I think, I think the, the, I mean, trade finance is, a, is roughly $8 billion a year. So there are some specialists which are saying that it's going to be reduced by 1.5, by 3 billion. At the end of the day, nobody really knows about that. What we really know and, uh, is that the commodity will still move from the producing countries to the uh, consuming countries. So that's going to continue to exist. And basically, the market will, uh, will adapt to be able to continue to, uh, to finance uh, those, uh, those flows. Uh, obviously, uh, the, uh, the, the, the digital, digitalization would be part of it, but I, I will uh, let uh, Michael to talk about this uh, a, bit, uh, a bit later. But I wanted just to, uh, to uh, highlight one point that you have mentioned before is the best practices that uh, mm -hmm. we are looking at. In Singapore, I just wanted to mention an initiative which has been uh, launched by the regulators. We are talking about MAS with all the, the banks in Singapore and the, the traders and trying to find the, the best practices. Again, I think we'll uh, discuss that, uh, which is uh, very important to me, that we need a mass adoption, uh, being the digitalization, but also the best, practice, best practices. So you can't have the best practices in Singapore if they are not in uh, Geneva or in, in, in the US. So I think it's, it's a very complex subject because it's a global subject and one, one, uh, one place in the world will not be able to solve the overall uh, complex uh, you, you, you raise a very good, important point there too. I mean, in, and I'm just going back to agriculture, we have these global organisations like GAFTA or FOSFA where the whole industry comes together um, and they're vehicles for us to shift, um, shift thinking in the industry. And I think the agriculture industry when it comes to digitalisation has managed to get together a lot better than other parts of the ecosystem when we talk about commodities. So I wonder if there's actually an opportunity here for finally for organisations within either trade finance in particular, as that's our subject here, but also broadly amongst commodity players um, throughout the value chains, to actually have those big industry organisations, someone who can pull us all together um, under a centralised body. And as you say, I mean, we need to have that, 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 that group um, agreement across the globe, really. Is there, is there such an organisation around that you could point to, you think? Do not, uh, I do not know any uh, such organization, but uh, I, I, I actually uh, agree with you that it would be interesting to have such organization would be, which would be able to, to rule a bit the community of trade finance. Max, I think, uh, Max got someone. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, sorry, yeah. this is Michael. Yeah, maybe you can, uh, Michael, sorry. You, you could, you, could uh, you know, di direct this question to the ICC, uh, maybe to WTO, maybe to UNC trial. And, you know, as you know, you know, there are various uh, organizations that uh, uh, set the rules uh, for, for our business. We, we um, have tried this, uh, Michael. We, we, we have tried this at, at various stages. And the, one of the challenge is, challenges is there's a lot of diversity in the ecosystem of quality trade finance globally. So, um, and there are lots of subcommittees. So, um, you've got the various bankers associations. When, when uh, The first time I remember... Uh, already 20 years ago, a group of us got together in Geneva. Uh, we were then headed off at the past by the Geneva Trade and Shipping Association and then eventually the Swiss Trade and Shipping Association, uh, who said, well, we do that. Um, we said, well, yeah, you do that for Switzerland. You don't do that for everybody else. And then, then we tried to do it in London. And then you've got the, uh, the British Bankers Association have got a, a committee for trade. And it's got all the, the top people on it, like you know, John Turnbull and, and these people who are also in the ICC. The ICC has got various subcommittees and they're putting together a, um, a, a team right now to look at issues in commodity trade finance and how to address them. Uh, the Americans have got their their uh, association and, and so on. And as you go around the various um, hubs globally, um, 
there's this sort of fragmented response where there are a lot of quite long established bodies um, which uh, cover some of the ground. I, 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 I think um, Damien's absolutely right. I, 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 I liked a lot of what you said, Damien. I, I found myself agreeing with everything, which doesn't happen to be a lot on panels. Um, uh, I, I think we do need something for commodity trade finance globally, which doesn't um, have um, uh, particular lobby groups, because a lot of the um, the heavy guys at the big banks, like um, uh, Jean-François Lambert, who, when he was at HSBC, had a, um, a lot of clout when he turned up in front of um, regulators, they've all gone. Um, the whole generation has gone. And uh, today, all of the all of the colleagues still working in banks are much, much more um, under the cosh when it comes to talking out about regulators. The, the, your compliance team will not let you talk about regulators on, on a public forum. Yeah. It's much tougher. Um, thanks for that. I mean, I suppose one of the other challenges, and we're not going to face that one here because it's take far too long, but is that is that shift between globalisation back to localisation. What we need here is more globalisation, effectively, for the industry to get together to really drive this kind of change, particularly with the adoption rate for, for technology that is there. Um, you know, we, we've got a provider right here that we're, we're hosting the call. So, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully globalisation can still rebound from this and, and uh, in the face of the localisation push. With that said, um, I'm just going to move on to question three, if that's okay. And I'd like to direct this one to Michael. Um, we've talked about trust. Um, we've talked about a few things here. We heard, actually, last night, I heard on a couple of conversations with the major oil CEOs, conversation about consolidation is likely to also come out of this fraud case as well. Um, liquidity being um, under or being challenged from the providers within the industry. And the big ones like, let's say, Avitol, the Trafigura, um, um, Mercuria, Glencore, um, potentially more consolidation of their power and their percentage of the global commodity supply chain. And how is that really good for the, for the whole industry as a whole to have that consolidating? Um, so just over to you for your thoughts um, on that one. No, I, I would say that obviously, uh, you know, concentration of, uh, of power is not good, <laughs> you know, to some some extent and, and you're right you know with the liquidity drying out what's happening is that uh, this is pushing out the, the second tier uh, traders so uh, second tier traders today uh, are having some difficulties getting uh, financing you know, from banks uh, or, or from funds uh, if the funds are going to take over uh, so we see uh, indeed you know that the, the likes of uh, you mentioned you know, Trafigura, Vitol, Mercuria obviously are, are, are relying I would say, you know, more now than ever on uh, uh, corporate funding uh, rather than, uh, you know, trade financing, uh, meaning that they have the a balance sheet that they can that they can leverage and also a, a long-standing relationship with banks. Um, but, uh, you know, just to, to answer also the question, question three, um, if there is a, a, a lesson to be learned, uh, it's definitely, and, and John, uh, you know, touch on that. Uh, it's definitely that the industry needs, needs to move on, uh, and and we can't rely anymore on paper documents. I mean, this is ridiculous. It's been obviously ridiculous for a few years, but now we, we we've started to we, we we've hit really a, a turning point where I think the industry is really in a sort of survival mode, um, and and uh, and and coincidentally, um, this is coming when. You know, we talk about blockchain. You know, blockchain is is, is finally possible, and and blo blockchain has been made possible by you see the uh, the increase in computing power. Um, uh, you know, blockchain actually has been created in 1995, so it's been around for a long time, for 25 years. Uh, the first real application was Bitcoin, uh, which dates back from 2008, uh, and so now that we see you know some applications for uh, for blockchain, for blockchain or smart contracts, uh, being you know just blockchain basically with a with a layer of code on top of it, uh, is uh, you know seems, seems to get some traction, um, and and I think that's that's really positive that some companies uh, you know are launching some initiatives that are now very localized, uh, but I think that that probably have enough legs to uh, to become uh, to become global at some point. Uh, again. I want to bounce back on what uh, Damien and, and John just said. 
uh, it's true that it's very difficult, you know, for us to to to, uh, to, to get a form to, to discuss and 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 to to get everybody, you know, on the same platform. First of all, you you have many platforms. You know, many initiatives are being launched by, I would say, private interest. Those interests being, you know, maybe you know, banks uh, joining forces with the traders, with inspectors and shippers, you know, which is very good. But but you have a few of those initiatives, and and each of them are taking the problem by a different end. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, at some point, yeah, there needs to be uh, um, a standardization. Um, uh, everybody needs to uh, also, you know, allow those different platforms to talk to each other, uh, whether that is, you know, through API or, 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 or through the development of a common platform. Uh, but but we, we are living exciting times, you know, from, from that perspective. Uh, if you're looking at the uh, trade cloud, for instance, you know, I think trade cloud is just a few old, a few few years old. Um, you know, some other companies that have been developing, you know, blockchain um, solutions, uh, I would say like sort of electronic BLs or what have you, uh, have been set up you know, in, in 2018, uh, and I've done their first transaction in 2019. You have also some trade finance platforms that are very interesting and that can be plugged, you know, on those, uh, uh, on those logistic uh, platforms. Um, so, yeah, I think this is, this is very exciting and that's what the industry needs. Um, Sorry, I was just going to say, following on from some of the stuff you said and, and, and another thought is that we talked about consolidation being bad but potentially, potentially, to play devil's advocate, maybe it could be good in a way because we could actually get that sort of consolidation driving adoption of digital technologies instead of the fragmentation we've got. And maybe then we can xylophone back out, or sorry, concentrate it back out to bring in some of the small traders after this COVID crisis is finished. But maybe, maybe that's good for the adoption on a, on a globalised scale. I don't know, what are your thoughts? <laughs> yes, I suppose so. Yeah, on the on the technology front, you definitely uh, need some. Sub, uh, I don't know if consolidation is the right word, but uh, some sort of harmonization. Uh, and you can compare that. Uh, I think there is a, a picture in the background of a uh, of a container ship, right? So uh, you know the container box <laughs> uh, uh, had had at some point you know, to be standardized. Uh, imagine you know the same ship with uh, I don't know India, you know doing. Uh, 10 feet long containers and, and the US doing 40 feet long containers, you know, that, that would look like Tetris, you know, that wouldn't look like this uh, nicely organized ship. So it's exactly what's happening uh, that we, uh, at some point, and I, and I think that it will happen naturally anyway, you know, it's a, it's a law of nature that uh, the, 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 the best solution will emerge uh, and then you will have everybody, you know, uh, joining uh, na naturally. Can I ask, I'll throw this open to the floor, right? So just please, just any of you guys raise your hands if, you, like, if you'd like to tackle this one. Um, but what about, so I think if you talk about technology, it always like lurks in the back of people's minds, particularly if they're used to doing paper transactions, um, they're a little bit older school, like some with Ray in their beards. Um, if we're actually thinking, well, what, hang on, what about security? If we go down this path of digitalization in something we've known for a long time, it's worked for a lot of time, um, what about security? We hear a lot about this with the elections in the United States, talking on a bigger scale. Um, is, is that a valid concern for, for that, this sort of leap into the digital space as far as contracting and all the rest of it? How, how would you approach that for the, from a naysayer's perspective, if someone was to challenge that? Who would like to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can answer, yeah. <laughs> uh, security, so you, you have in mind, obviously, uh, uh, cyber threats and and uh, those kind of things. So 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 again, uh, at some point, you know, because the blockchain is a bit of a buzzword, and at, for many years it looked like a, a solution without a problem. Uh, but but actually, yeah, blockchain, you know, if, if one thing, I mean, it, it is safe, right? That, that's uh, it's decentralized. Um, um, you know, it's uh, immutable. Um, you have a, it's auditable as well. You have an audit trail, obviously, of all the, the transactions. So, so it's always a concern because obviously, you, you, we've all heard about, you know, Bitcoin banks, you know, being hacked. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, as far as I know, I mean, there is no, there is no better technology from that perspective. Now, security also has another meaning, right? Which is like um, 
uh, you know, banks know that, like having uh, security over some goods. And, and, and that's probably, you know, where there is more work to, 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 to be done. Um, all the legal framework, you know, surrounding the validity, uh, the enforceability and the opposability of uh, an electronic uh, bill of lading. Um, I think there is a lot of work, you know, being done currently, but again, it's a, it's a local problem because each jurisdiction will consider, uh, you know, uh, an electronic bill of lading uh, under a blockchain platform differently. Um, so maybe John has a view on that. Um, um, I, I think you're absolutely right. It, it is a balkanized uh, landscape for that sort of thing. I, I, I think the hard part with um, blockchain, and I, I say this as, as somebody who's not techie at all, um, is it, um, it isn't smart enough, is it? Uh, it? It's like a pistol. It's very good at shooting people if you point it in the right direction, but you've got to point it in the right direction. And um, whenever you see the developers, there's always this sort of disconnect between the people who know about commodity trade finance and the people who know about tech. And if you could get a, a techie who knew about commodity trade finance or a commodity trade finance person who knew about tech, maybe you'd get a, a better solution. I, um, I I was looking at the Congo offering where they, they said, well, they, this business this of title, they, they can establish who's got a charge over an invoice at least, which is progress. And, and if they can do it for an invoice, and presumably they ought to be able to do it for a, a bill of lading and a, uh, a warehouse uh, warrant or receipt. <clears throat> um, and, and they seem to have a, a mix of people from different backgrounds on, in their um, in their headcounts. But I, I don't think we, we've yet got to the point that maybe the current crisis will catalyze this um, where we can go fully electronic. It's quite scary to think what people can do with digital these days, isn't it? I mean, I've, I've seen Skyfall, um, where uh, Xavier Bardem stands there and says, oh, but I click, I can uh, destabilize the government in Afghanistan. Um, yes, you can actually, can't you? Um, you can rig an election, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, and that's quite scary. Um, if you can do that securely, and if you've got a platform that allows you to um, do things securely and identify people, that would be a great, uh, a great step forward. Uh, I, I was hearing recently, um, at the Zook uh, Commodity Association webinar last week, um, uh, that um, there was an attempt in Europe to establish a golden source for KYC um, across European countries, which you would have thought are in a certain amount of union. Um, and uh, it, it ground to a halt because everybody had their own requirements. Uh, and, and, and KYC, as we know, has become worse and worse and worse, and it's become KYCC as well. And um, when I try to identify myself um, to whoever I'm looking at a bank account or, or whatever, um, not guilty, that wasn't me, uh, then um, uh, I, I rather mourn for the days where I, I knew who my bank manager was and I knew him by sight and I, I knew what house he lived in and um, could walk around there and, and uh, look into his garden. Um, those days have gone, but maybe we can do it digitally, but we, we, we need uh, everybody to get behind certain standards. Yeah. Yeah, if, I, if, I, if I can bounce on this, actually, I, w I just want to say that obviously, you know, technology is not the only solution. There is the, the golden triangle of, uh, of IT uh, is, uh, you know, the, the famous PPT uh, framework, which is uh, people, processes and technology and in that order. Uh, being obviously people first, you know, recruit the right people, train them, uh, then processes, you know, devise the right processes and, and to make sure that they are robust uh, and they are adopted obviously by the people. And then, you know, look at the technological part. And it's a bit of an iteration anyway, because once you have the technology, you will realize that, well, you know, uh, uh, that software, you know, can't exactly reproduce the, uh, you know, the processes or is not enough uh, user friendly. And, and, and then you, you know, you go back, you train your people, you know, to use the technology or you readapt your technology to, sorry, you readapt your processes to the technology and so on. So technology alone cannot solve uh, all the problems. Uh, you, uh, you know, you have to rely on, on people. And, and uh, you know, um, a person and a computer will always do better than the computer alone. 
I think you, you make a very good point there too, Michael, in that um, in some of the other conversations I hear too about recruitment, when we talk about bringing people into this industry, and I'm talking across the whole ecosystem of commodities from trade finance through to uh, you know, accumulating grain at a farm or digging it out of the ground, um, is that a lot of the trade houses are talking about recruiting people that have programming skills, they have, they have digital skills, they have technology skills. So they're not taking a trader who's using gut instinct anymore. They're taking a much more evolved um, uh, hybrid trader out of the universities and that's what they want. So hopefully we do get that adoption rate through the new, um, uh, new recruits into our industry as well. So um, that should help with that, that, that inflection point in the adoption, I hope as well. So people is a great, a great point there. Well, I think the traders have been better on this. Better. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I, I think the traders have been better on this than the banks, to be honest. I know, um, in, in Geneva, the University of Geneva does a master's in trade commodities and shipping. And, and I did a stint uh, teaching on that. And um, a lot of the students on that were sent by the, the Swiss trading companies. Um, I don't think I remember any of them being sent by any of the banks. Um, but the traders were sending their people to get trained. Um, banks are not very good at that. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get sent off to the odd um, two-day, three-day course uh, in a bank, but they don't do the training the way they used to do. What, what you get as a junior in a bank is a grand tour of the bank where, where you might spend a few weeks in one area, but it's not like it used to be. It's not, not like a formal uh, training program. The Germans used to have a thing called the Ausbildung, which is like a sort of banking apprenticeship, which was a four-year process, which uh, really was thorough. But um, uh, that, that seems to have gone by the board. Yeah, Mac, that sounds like a great idea and a great challenge to the banks, right? I mean, maybe that's one of the takeaways from this discussion we have here, which sounds like it's a, it's a cracker for the trade finance industry as a challenge to train their people um, yeah. throughout, through, throughout the, the, you know, from leadership down to their new recruits. That's a, that's a cracker. Good stuff. Um, just in the interest of time, because we've got probably 10 minutes left and we've got a couple more questions to go through. I'd like to pass over to Marilyn now for your thoughts on how digitalization, so that's on to question four, um, and then we'll move on to DAF. So what are your thoughts here about um, how we can mitigate the risk of fraud, um, obviously, as a, as a representative work of the banks as well? I think the main interest and the main reason to go digital is it makes everything easy. Trade finance is a very paper heavy transaction. There's so many different chains involved and every transaction is different. So having everyone on the same distribution ledger technology and all the transactions and all participations, everything in real time is important. And it's also important that the data not be altered because we don't want any falsification. Uh, in terms of, you know, everything digital is much easier to track and transfer. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And you find, how are you finding within your organization too, the adoption rate, like people getting more comfortable with it, the changes that that requires to move from paper? I think it's a, a two-way street. It's between, between the banks and the clients as well, because I've worked with the same people for over 20 years. It's the same people, maybe in different, uh, different institutions, different banks. So we all know each other. So as mentioned, it is about the younger generation. So maybe they will have these same relationships, but the world is so much bigger now. It's not as, uh, doesn't seem as small as, you know, when I first started the community, it's grown so much because commodity trade finance continues to grow. So if they're allowed to have this uh, digital platform that's authentic, I think that can help build trust, but it has to be you know, uniform with all the, between the clients and the banks. And from your experience within the bank, obviously with COVID, we're having to work from home. So we have to rely a lot more on digitalization right throughout our, uh, our interactions, um, both personally, we have families in different parts of the world and also obviously for business. Are you finding that's also turbo, inje turbo injecting the adoption and, and um, the, the rate of acceptance in the banking system to, to new technologies? Absolutely. I think work from home, you know, just as a, a simple concept was something that really was not frowned upon, but it wasn't really done. You know, we weren't a big tech company to work from home all the time. And now it's embraced. It's worked really well. We probably actually work more, but it works. And there hasn't been that 
an issue with it. So I think going forward, this will help boost the, the push for technology. And and it seems like also technology is being good for DNI as well. Diversity and inclusion has level the playing field in other ways as well. So that um, diversity and inclusion uh, issue that the industry and commodities particularly has played for a long time too seems to be helped by digitalisation. What do you think? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, sorry, I, was, I was just saying that, that diversity and inclusion seems to be helped by digitalisation as well. It seems to level the playing field, particularly in the commodity zone. I'm sorry, can you, I can't, you're breaking up a bit. Ah, uh, sorry. I hope it's not my Wi-Fi again. Um, Def, do you want to just repeat that? Yeah, sure. And, you know, the point, I think, uh, just to repeat the question, Marilyn, that Andrew was making was that digitization does seem to perhaps level the playing field in that it, it allows more participants to participate and it level the playing field in terms of um, equality amongst the different people who are trying to perform their roles right if everyone has the tool at their hands then you have much less stratification amongst the the, the people who are able to contribute to their business you know be that from 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 different uh, different areas of the business or or different backgrounds that if they have the tools at their fingertips at a low cost, that they can all contribute and therefore it levels the playing field amongst the different people who, who could be contributing. Right, and it's getting the tool to everyone uh, because I think that's going to be a concern with this global digitalization is will this tool be for everyone? You know, if you work with some small countries, uh, in Central America, will they be able to access this? Uh, some countries that we work with, I mean, they're still using faxes. So mm -hmm. it's being able to get this to everyone on a global scale to open up the market more. Yeah. Um, I'm getting some questions in here quickly. So just before, just in the interim, what I might do is pass over to Daph first. Um, and so that's on question five. And then we're gonna hit some of these questions we've got here with the time we've got left. So deaf digitalization is a journey, not a big bang event. Um, how do players begin their digitalization journey and what are the first steps? And just before you answer that for a second, if that relates to some of the questions we've got here. Um, and I can pick a couple of them. How does digitalization replace trust and risk? Um, and some of the ones too around blockchain and supply chain tracking field, um, trade traceability is possible. Um, these are some sort of themes we've got coming through on the questions as well. So, um, over to Jeff. Yes, yeah, so to answer all those three sort of in the same topic, because they, they all touch on very similar things, you know, really, we, we believe that, as you say, digitization is a journey, right? So um, we believe that very strongly at TradeCloud. A lot of the conversations around technology and digitization are searching for the golden bullet or silver bullet answer right now. And our belief is that isn't really where we need to go. We need to be making sure that we make the first steps in the right direction, because technology will mean that we're ever evolving in what we use as our systems within our businesses, and that will always be improving. What if we need practical steps, like taking the right first steps? The approach that we have at TradeCloud, for example, is start at the beginning. So we, we start our process at that initial interaction between two counterparts, be that trading counterparts or a third party service provider and an underlying principle. And so start there, digitize from the beginning, just like how you start at the beginning when you book your airline flight online these days, and then all of the connected services that come to you through technology are born from that initial digital interaction. And from that point on, digitize the communications between the stakeholders. So what we're saying is, Digitize the stuff that will always need to happen in a physical commodity business. The interactions between internal stake stakeholders and external stakeholders will always have to happen, independent of what technology comes along. But we need to digitize them. We think of an analogy with building a house. Many people start the project of building a house with an idea. What windows, what doors, what carpets, what sofas they want. But they don't start by getting those things. They start by building scaffolding, foundations, and structure to the building. And those enable you to then later start adding and connecting the things that you really desire for your house. 
And what we're trying to sort of communicate in this conversation around digitization and what we're trying to implement in our product is just that. Focus first on building that infrastructure. Focus on building the scaffolding, the foundations and the structure that you must have in place. And then that enables you to start building things around to improve your business through digitization. And that structure, that infrastructure, that scaffolding and foundation is to start at the beginning, capture the initial interactions between the counterparts and digitize all of those communications between stakeholders. Because that always needs to happen. And I think that answers the question of trust. And that answers the question of how to apply blockchain. Basically, you need to capture those interactions. You need to verify them as true. You need to verify them as up to date. Why rely on trust when to, these days we can rely on facts? And when you capture those things digitally, they become facts rather than facts. Thank you. Okay. Um, so in the interest of time getting some background, we, we do want to sort of move on, Andrew, if that's okay. Uh, we, we have a quick um, video of what we're doing to carry that out, which I would like to put in front of everyone and then some final, final thoughts. Uh, just to keep everyone on the hour, because maybe people have meetings to move on to. So I will gate crash here and just put on a quick one minute video of what it is that we're doing here at Trade Cloud. The Trade Cloud Commodities Web is now live. Our post-trade communications platform links all participants in the physical trade cycle on a shared ledger using blockchain technology. All communications are safe and secure with a full audit trail, even for chat, recorded on the blockchain. The platform automatically organizes your post-trade business, providing unparalleled internal transparency in real time, thus reducing costs and increasing efficiency within your organization. The Commodities Web builds trust between all external parties by reducing the inherent risks associated with executing physical business. And being cloud-based is accessible anywhere at any time. To learn more, visit tradecloud.sg or email info at tradecloud.sg. Okay, so thank you everyone for letting me gate crash that conversation a little bit. I'll let you in, Andrew, and then hand over to Matty for our closing thoughts. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Um, I'd just like to pass, just quickly, if we can get one or 30 second, 20 second grab from each one of the panelists. Um, just on your thoughts, as a key takeaway from this discussion, on is 2020 the inflection year for digital adoption? So I'm going to pass to you first, um, um, Marilyn. Absolutely. I think uh, what's gone on in Europe and COVID, it's the year that everyone's going to move forward to try to resolve and be more digital. Great. Super. That's one vote. <laughs> Damien? Uh, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I think uh, sitting in Asia, I mean, we have no choice and uh, all the actors have no choice but to... Uh, get into the digitalization to make sure that uh, they still continue to be able to trade, to finance, to move the goods. So I'm uh, very positive on the, on the future and uh, digitalization is obviously one part of it. Uh, hi, Michael. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I also think that uh, 2020 uh, is really the inflection point and it's been crystallized by by the lockdown and obviously you know that that already started uh, as we've seen you know 25 years ago accelerated over the past two to three years but but definitely uh, the, the covid has been successful where your cto wasn't so, <laughs> so yeah very good thank you and john just a quick one and then we pass on to matt for a, for a wrap i think everyone's looking for a solution here and everyone is hoping it's going to be digital. It's certainly a buzzword that has the uh, attention of senior management. They, they want to see what digital solutions are we going to have. Um, I would just caution that much as I like that um, catchphrase, why rely on trust when you can rely on facts, that does require the facts to be correct. And as we've discovered, it's actually quite possible to fake facts digitally. Yeah. Crack that one, you've got a better mousetrap. 
Well, we've had a president who's talked that right the way through in the US, haven't we? Um, all right, with that, let's close. Uh, so thank you very much for all the panelists. That was a great discussion. Thank you. Sorry if we didn't get through questions. Sorry if we didn't cover all of the ground, but I think um, there's a lot there to take away. And over to Matt to close out. Thank you, Matt. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Um, so I've been scribbling down some notes as we've been talking over the last hour. Um, and some interesting takeaways. So Mac talked about 18 big frauds, um, mostly around title fraud, who owns the goods. Um, I think eDocs it clearly needs more support from laws and regulators, but I, I think it's a no-brainer and we all agree um, that we shouldn't be taking the postal risk and we should be having a digital solution there. Damien put some very big numbers in front of us, three and a half billion, two times one billion. And of course you have the banks then looking at their portfolios, reducing lines, came in with the price moves, margin calls, liquidity issues. And that's really damaging the, um, the industry. Um, Damien also talked about fake documents from traders and even using um, email domains of customers, faking them. Um, so the big takeaway from, from Damien's part, I think, was trust issues. Um, in terms of Michael's, what I really liked about Michael's, and I'm a big advocate of this, um, and we have, we're regularly phoned up when we have these big frauds and say, so well, what can digitalization do to solve them? I like the PPT triangle. People, make sure they know what they're doing, train them. Uh, processes, uh, if you don't send the supervision company to check that that stockpile is there, don't be surprised if it's not there. Um, when you actually find out that it's, uh, it's missing. So tech is obviously what brings it all together, but if it's not married up with good training of people and with good processes, uh, tech will undoubtedly not be able to solve um, all of the problems. Um, Marilyn, the big takeaway from her was data cannot be altered. I mean, on the blockchain, this is absolutely the case. And I think that's a large part of identifying fraud. Um, so what are we trying to do? Mac, Mac, you made a comment that if you can get people that know the industry and the tech guys, if they can cross understand each other's business, then we're on a good direction. Uh, that's, we're kind of a bit unique in trade cloud in that we've got very senior people from the commodity industry. And we've done just that. What we've tried to do is to understand the technology and then we've tried to use that technology to reduce and manage the inherent risks of trading physical commodities. Um, we're passionate about using a shared ledger where everybody is connected. The blockchain where you've basically got a full audit trail. But I think what it creates by creating this transparency in the trade cycle is you've got a lot of checks and balances that will capture a lot of the frauds that are going on. You can bring in third party verification at many different stages. Um, and the identity of these people is clear when they're coming onto a platform such as Trade Clouds, as opposed to in Damien's example, if they're fraudulently creating email domains of their customers. All this boils down to one thing, it boils down to trust. Um, the last point I'd like to make is that um, there has been some talk of, okay, are we going to go with one platform? Are we going to go with many platforms? I, I believe that blockchain allows us to be connected and to have connected services. So I can see Trade Cloud in the future being connected to eDoc providers, to um, booking, a, to basically tracking of goods. Um, through uh, GPSs. I can see us linking with companies such as uh, Contour, for example. I don't believe there will need to be one specific solution, but I do believe that these solutions need to be connected, as Michael said, through APIs, etc. cetera. Um, I, I saw one of the questions from Udo Klein. He mentioned, what about insurance? And I, I think he's absolutely right. And insurance um, 
obviously, just like with the banks, if you can give them confidence, banks will hopefully offer more lines, the financing will become cheaper. It's the same with insurance companies. If we solve the, the issues or reduce the, the risks involved, losses will be less, premiums will be less, everyone will be happy. So yes, it's absolutely part of the plan um, for insurance companies to be part of the trade cloud commodity web. Look at audit companies. If you have a transparent platform that provides a great overview of what's going on on an individual trade cycle, then the value of an auditor will be that much better. If I'm the boss of a big company, I want my auditors to tell me where my problems are, where my holes are. And we've had 18 big frauds, which means 18 times, or maybe 15 times, the auditors haven't picked it up. So again, it's the auditors that um, help to um, provide confidence in the overall structure. Last comment, if you'd like to join the journey of digitalization, um, we have a, a final slide where you can contact us. Um, we do believe that we have the solution today. Um, we launched our, our blockchain platform and the Trade Cloud Commodity Web uh, a month ago. Um, please book a demonstration, have a look at what we're doing. Um, all we want to do is use technology to make this industry better, safer, more efficient. Um, and I think we're all on the same page there. So we obviously need the support of people to come and have a look at what we're doing, start the adoption, and then as we, as we um, have more and more customers, we'll be brainstorming and using technology to solve people's everyday problems. So thank you very much, everybody. Panelists, you did a great job. Uh, Andrew, fantastic moderator as always from Avatar. Um, and Def, thank you very much for putting it all together. Much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. See you in the next Trade Talks. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.